Welcome to the best podcast on the entire internet. The best post-Christmas podcast. Right. Post-Christmas, uncomfortable, feeling chubby, got to go write off all the calories. No, 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 I'm not. I'm just, no, I'm just wallowing in it and it's wonderful. Bathing, bathing in the the quote unquote recovery time. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, spending time with family. It's it's pretty awesome. Holidays, just spend time with your family. You don't got to ride today. So we are currently coming to you from the Road ID studios in one of our farewell episodes farewell from episode, the yeah. road ID studios we're not going anywhere but our studio is is uh going away for a while as we build a new studio indeed um this is the gravel lot part of the widening a podium network of shows and my name is john my name is doug and the gravel lot starts from the common connection spot of the bicycle but it is so much more than that to us we love everything bike related, and I think more importantly that we consider you guys family. Except we don't buy you Christmas presents or holiday presents well, because we, we're giving them a episode. Oh yeah, a podcast. So this is what we got you. It's a day late. You, you can belated, unra- belated <laughs> Christmas. It unwrap was this gift. Amazon lost it between the seats. <laughs> they were supposed to deliver it. Prime. Uh, but ju- but just like you guys are so much more than cyclists. Yeah, we want to talk about the stuff that is around your life and talk to people who are doing things in cycling and the things around their lives. That's right. important to us. You have a bike. We have a bike. Yep. Let's, Let's talk, talk about bikes. Yeah. So on to today's episode, which is being brought to you by everyone over at Be Free Ride Bikes Cycling Apparel. Right. If you ride in it. They make it, whatever it may be, tops, bottoms, outerwear, underwear. That'd be base don't layers, ride your right? Underwear. Yeah, that would be un- that would right. Be, yeah. un- that's wear under you your under wear. Your wear. Not, don't wear underwear. Don't wear under chamois cream, socks, warmers, all of the stuff. And all of those can be customized to your exact specifications. Yeah, not just artwork, but fabrics and fits and. All of that. All of it. We did that for our team uh, this past year. Everybody has loved the gear. Um, you know, the BFRB has been great to work with from that perspective. Um, but, you know, they have off-the-shelf stuff, too, and you can make that happen. Um, we've been working with him for, I think, the last four kit orders yeah. we've done and have been continually blown away by the quality and, and just being able to pick our own fabrics and the turnaround time. Super short. Really great attention to detail. Getting things right for us has been awesome. Yeah, and this is this is another one of those where it's you know it's not just us talking about it. Our you know the show is presented by blah 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 blah. No, we're living like, this lifestyle. We yeah we we are. This is all we ride in. Yes. Um. So this is this is definitely it has our seal of approval. Um. You should go check it out. You should go look into it. Head over to bfrbcycling.com. That's the letters B F R B cycling.com take a look how they can help you and your entire team really get outfitted for 2020 yeah in this nice new year that's right around the corner and the things that we're going to be talking about yeah you're going to need probably a whole kit and caboodle of kit and caboodle yeah i'm going to have to think about kit and caboodle for this thing because today we are going to talk with some awesome folks who are doing a really awesome event that's kind of local to us and has really been growing over the past couple years but everybody needs if you're within a six hour driving distance you should not be missing this this is a really amazing event and and we had a really great conversation with the folks who put this race on we're super excited they were able to join us actually in the studio which was great came down um we had we had a lot of fun and we learned a lot about their kind of it's like the buddy comedy that John and I have is kind of there like, hey, do you want to make a thing? Let's make a thing. And right. they built a thing, and it's really great to get to hear their story. Uh, we hope you all enjoy it. But one point that I want to bring up before we dive into this here is it is currently the 26th that yes. we are releasing this episode. Yes. Right. Um, What's a couple days away? In in a very, very short time, which would be January 1st, which is what, five days? Right? 31? Math. Six, yeah, thirty. It's next week. It's next week. Next Monday. Yes. Next Monday, at midnight. I'm assuming. I assume bike reg just goes live. Yeah. At the yeah. January first, you can register for the Black Fork Gravel Grinder, and you should, and you should, because this sucker is going to sell out and sell out quick. They've capped registrations yes. at a really low number, so you need to get in and get in now. We're going to be doing this. Right. I might be doing this on a mountain bike. Because I'm warming up for BCBR, yes. But like, we're doing this, 
Ellen's doing it. John's doing it. I'm doing it. A whole bunch of people I know are doing it. I, this thing's going to sell out quick. So get in there and get your registration in. Heck, m- make yourself a calendar appointment right now and then listen to the rest of this episode. Yeah. So, yeah, go do that and, and listen listen specifically to why they capped the event. Because I think people get unreasonably pissed when events get capped. But if you actually listen to them explain why this event got capped, I think you'll be... I think you'll be more incentivized to to want to get in and sign up before before it actually gets closed out. Agreed. Let's roll this. So our guests today are joining us right here in the lovely Road ID studio. It's been a while. It has. I mean, we're, we're so used to talking to the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, phone. Hello, right. phone. But but we finally have some people in the studio, and a number of them coming up in the upcoming weeks. You will get to hear. It's going to be a busy week for us. You guys don't see that because you're just seeing uh, something came out something my computer came out on my week, phone. Yeah. My phone said something. But our guests are here today in the Road ID studio. They are joining us because of their successes with creating marquee events in the Midwest. Most notably, their latest venture, the Black Fork Gravel Grinder. They are Jay Clips and Matt Simpson, and we are going to let them tell you their story so let's jump right in welcome guys to the gravel lot so first uh i want to say for for both of us we're pretty stoked to be here it's pretty exciting we've been working on this for a while because originally we were trying to get you guys in in the in the summer and then both of you kept saying well we're going we're going riding we're going to moab we're going here and it's (laughs) like i can't compete with that go go play bikes we'll be here Bikes first. Yeah. Mm. Bikes first. We're like yeah. we're like the, 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 the fallback girl on this one. <laughs> it's all right. I'm good with that. <laughs> I'm okay with that. It's a good place that. to be. It's I'm winter okay. time. Yes. Everyone's yes. planning out their springs and their and their future. Yes. So it's a good time to talk about all these sort of things. Because you want to you're gonna yeah, you're gonna want to put their event on your calendar for, for sure. sure. But thank you. We're glad we're glad you guys were able to be here. This is exciting. Yeah, well thanks for having us. So you you've listened to the show. We're very lucky. You guys are Pebbles, which is awesome. And thank you for being Pebbles. We appreciate your support. That's awesome. But so you guys know what we want to ask you first, right? We want to know how you guys found bikes in your life. So you can I don't know arm wrestle uh, to decide who gets to go first. Or decide amongst yourselves. I get to go first. Okay, I'll say arm wrest- <laughs> arm wrestling makes for great radio. <laughs> we could just describe how it was going. <laughs> He's making the oh he's making the over the top maneuver. He's making the over the top maneuver. Okay, Jay, you have won the arm wrestling contest that we have not had. Um, how did you discover bikes in your life? Um, actually, we we discovered it together. Really? So Matt and I have known each other for forty plus years. What? Yeah. Little kids. Little like kids. Really little, like t ball ish or before. Wow. Yeah. Riding little BMX bikes around. Uh, Around the same area that we ride uh, now. Yeah. And and for all of our listeners, where is that? So it's in the Mohican area, uh, Knox County and uh, Shockton, Holmes County, that area. Mm-hmm. Um, Matt grew up. I grew up in Gambier. where you know. Hey, we were just there. Ridden. Yeah. It was, so. war- it was warm when we were there. Maybe we'll come back. I, I want to come back in the fall because I feel like that would be beautiful in the fall. Yeah, it's a, it's a great place to grow up with Canyon College there and all the amenities and you know fishing and hiking so for everyone Biking for everyone stuff, outside so. of Ohio, we're talking about Ohio right yeah. now. We're Central Ohio. Like yeah. Like yeah, Central Ohio. We're just Ohio. deep yeah. in the weeds about where yes. in Ohio. Yeah. We're like, yeah, yeah, that spot <laughs> with that thing. Yeah. So you guys grew up together. Pretty much, yeah. Yep. Yeah. We uh we would just trek out on Matt's farm on our little BMX bikes and ride around the gravel roads and and that's I mean, that's what where we uh fell in love with bikes. Mm-hmm. So you're yeah. doing gravel before it was cool. Yeah. Well, we had to because uh, that's all you had. Gravel, you know <laughs> what? It, just, it is what it is. You yeah. know, nothing so. out there is paved like that. Probably, especially forty years ago. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah that pro- stuff was not really paved. That was just wild country to some extent, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, it was. And and at the time, you kind of cussed the gravel because you're just trying to get to your buddy's house. Trying to get somewhere to do something more fun. Right. Biking wasn't the pure enjoyment. It sure. W- it was a way to get around, but. Uh, I remember some of the gravel was like, oh, my God, we got to climb this hill, you know, on our little BMX bikes with one gear. Wow. Oof. So having ridden there now and having experienced that, uh, gears. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You needed, you needed gears. Yeah. But you guys, if I guess it's one of those, like we talked about it, it was, I think it was with Celine. She just grew up with it. And if you grow up with it, you don't really, you're just like, well, that's, that's what it is. You just figure it out and you just adapt. And now we have gears and we're spoiled. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, so, you know, like Jay said, we've known each other since we were kids. Um, you know, high school, we were, we've always been friends, um, did a lot together. But uh, really, he and I got hooked up through Facebook when we were, you know, what, 10 years or so ago? About 10 years ago. I saw him. He was on a picture of himself on a mountain bike. I mountain bike AJ. I, I moved back from Chicago. So you got I see your bike, where do you go? And we just started talking, and next thing you know, we're biking again, you know, just like, like – when we were kids. What was the re- rediscovery of that, like, shared passion that, like, you guys, have been, I mean, being friends with, I mean, I'm friends with folks from high school and whatnot, and you, you go separate spaces in life, and there is that separation. What was it like rediscovering a friend and a thing that you had in common? What was that like for each of you? Well, I don't think we skipped a beat, to tell you the truth. we I remember the day distinctly because the night before, Matt, IMs me through Facebook and says, hey, you know, I mountain bike. Let's go mountain biking. Let's meet at P2, and, uh, which is it's a trail in, in Columbus. And I said, okay, that's great. So we met there after work the next day, rode our bikes like we were 10 years old. It was, it was amazing. And now we ride constantly. That's awesome. Yeah, it was that easy. I mean, So d- it in the time between being – little groms and and being grown adults with jobs and riding bikes after work like did either of you have a period where you weren't riding bikes or did it just continue for both of you we'll start with matt yeah i mean i uh i've always had a bike in the garage um but when i really got back into it was in 2008 when the um you know it's kind of market crashed and where i was working they kept having layoffs after layoff after layoff and they got to a small core group of folks and the boss you know ownership basically said we can either lay off more people or we can all take more time off and take a pay cut and so you can have every other friday off so we all said well let's just have every other friday off and take a pay cut so i care i have this extra day no family no kids what am i going to do and i got this old tr- uh, track uh, gary fisher in my garage and i said well let's, i'm going to take it out to p2 and and just start riding and check it out and i just had a blast so that was every other Friday I was getting out and, and doing some riding. And then I don't know how much it was before you know, I was checked out Jay and found him on Facebook. But then after that, of course, upgrading bikes and you know, been riding hardcore ever, really ever since. So there was a period in, in my life as well that um, there was a lull in the, bike, the biking and, um, you know, uh, the kids and, and wives. And, and that's what happens. And... Um, but I don't, I don't think it ever completely stopped. I always had a bike, and um, I've always enjoyed riding the bike. And I didn't start racing until 2010, I believe it was, 2010, 2011, I started racing. But um, until I started riding again with Matt, it wasn't, uh, it w- nothing was a hardcore type training or racing. So that's... S- so why do you think that is that that Matt was the the spark plug for for kicking that off for you? Um, I think training partners. Uh, it's important to have somebody to ride with, and Matt gave me that that person to ride with that I also enjoyed talking, you know, to about other things other than just biking. So uh, just the time on the bike, the camaraderie. And I'm sure you weren't competitive with each other at all when riding. Actually, no, not, not too much. I'm, <laughs> not, I'm, really? I'm not that competitive. Of one a bike, face honestly. looked one way and one yeah. face looked another. Jay is much more competitive on a, on a bike than I am. I am not that guy. I'm just out having fun. Now, we got into some competitive races. We can talk about this a little bit. So I upped my game to compete and to, to be able to finish long distance races. But he, he, he really is that guy that's got to beat you to the he, top of the he hill. Didn't just com- he didn't just up his game to finish long races. He... He upped his game to be able to do long, very long races, 100-mile mountain bike races, and have fun doing it the entire time. That is, that's raising the bar quite a bit. Because I, I think for everyone that's done any sort of distance, us included, there's, there's yeah. so many, it's just an emotional roller coaster if you're out for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah. whatever well. hours. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's, there's <laughs> the, the ability... It's a special ability for, and I've I only know a couple people that I've I've ever ridden with that can have that positive outlook the entire day. That that when they go through bad spells or something like that, they can still just be happy as a lark. And it's it's a gift. And obviously, you you're somebody hey. that has it. 
you're mountain biking out in the woods. It, it's not. It's you're suffering yeah. at times, maybe deeply suffering, but it's still. Hey, you're out in the woods on a bike, you know. So it's still. A good is time. it is it that simple for you? <laughs> like, cause I cause I'm one. Like Mostly. I want to I want to dig shape, into it. If you're in shape, it is. If you're not in shape and you try to do something, then it you're definitely some suffer. Or you're like, I want to be done. Okay, so you are admitting that you had some. I've done a couple. Jay, a little underestimating his. He he got in. He did the mo- he can 100 a year or two before um, we started riding heavily together, and he'd always kind of let's let's do. You should try this. You could just do it. And I I could barely get around the Mohican 24 mile loop in a day. And I was just crushed. I'm going back to the couch. I'm going to fall asleep because that's that's all I can handle. And I'm like, that's 25 miles. That's a good day. That's a good day. That's I'm a good bike. day. That's a lot of climbing. <laughs> this is not an easy trail. And 100 miles of that kind of riding, no. He kept I, chipping away. I was away. just the instigator. That's good. You got to have one of those in the relationship, right? right? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so you had some experience with that, and you know, you got to push your friends. I think that's important. John does that with me, and I think I do that with him. We get in little arguments you about back what we and should forth do, for sure. but we we push each other in different ways and try to give yourself some, like, okay, can I stretch you here? Oh, I don't know that I want to try cycle. Oh yeah, I want to try cycle cross. I'll go do that. And then I get obsessed with it, and then John's like, yeah, I got to do something else. You know, we it is that growth and that that depth. At what point did you guys? realized that just riding and doing events wasn't enough for you? Like, where did that fall in? Well, we were actually training for one of the 100-mile mountain bike races that we were doing, and I can't remember whether it was the Lumberjack or the Mohican. It was the Lumberjack. Okay. And um, we couldn't get on the trail. You know, in the springtime, early spring in Ohio, you're not getting on trails. Nope. (laughs) So... We had to find a place, and we knew there was gravel around, obviously. We, we grew up not too far from the area, but we didn't know the extent of what was there right in our neighborhood or right in our or where we grew up, I should say. Um, and so we started uh, just well, – Matt did it. He's, he's started scouting out different routes to get the most elevation. It wasn't about the gravel. It was about the elevation because we knew we needed to train on some hills. Yeah, you got, I mean, what do you, like Lumberjack, like that is how many feet vertical? Um, it's about 9,000, but okay. it's, it's a, basically 100% single track. So it's not as much climbing as some others, but it's, you're just on a trail the entire time. So that just ups the effort you yeah, know, exactly. all day long. So I was kind of scared. I'm like, I've told everybody I know I'm doing this event. I got to finish. So I was just like every hill I f- could find online on a you know on a a road map or whatever I'm gonna try to climb it because I'm like I cannot fail at this. So he and I just I just we just trained and trained our our butt off in any type of weather. But he's like it could be snowing in June in, Mo- in Michigan, so we better train in the winter <laughs> to prepare for it. You know <laughs> that was the attitude we took. Yep, it so didn't matter yeah, if it was we, raining or what. We didn't miss a training day, and and I will. I will blame Matt one hundred percent for that. He he kept me accountable and he would not allow me to miss any days of training. It didn't matter how bad the weather was or, or how bad we were feeling or anything else. But he also made all the routes for that, that period when we were training and, and those routes ended up being uh around the Mohican area and it ended up being on gravel and we we, d- we rediscovered what we ignored uh, when we were younger. Right. So what at uh, what time period is this that we're we're talking about training for lumberjack? Twenty fourteen. Yeah, fourteen. Okay. So we're we're getting into GPS computers are being pretty prolific. They're th- it's not like you're trying to, you know, get out a paper map and figure out how to get around. No, no, we were getting out a paper map. Yeah, I'm a map guy, so I like the okay. old school. But I Google Google Maps and sure. road maps and yeah, things pretty like much. That. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's some websites that have gravel roads and things so so f- for a lot of the trail and, and a lot of the roads that you guys are on some of the stuff up there is not it's not technically marked as a road so then how are how are you putting routes together like that well um one we would just we just be out there riding which would look at that let's take a left you know and where does this cool. go yeah and there's you know there was some roads where it started out as a kind of a relatively nicely groomed two road two lane gravel road Narrow down to one, narrow down to, are we even on a road anymore? Are we going to just end at somebody's cabin back in the woods? And it, it would pop out on another street. It was amazing. We're like, that's what triggered it. It's like, these are 
amazing. We didn't even know we had this kind of adventure cycling in Ohio. We've got to we got to get some people out here to ride with us because it was so. It sounds like you guys were just riding around like little kids. Totally. Like, oh, let's much, go yep. there. Let's go up that. Totally. That's what we still do today. I think so many people underestimate cycling for that exact reason. Is there's there's almost every single ride I'm ever on, even a commute to work, I have a moment during that ride that makes me feel like a little kid. Sure. And it's That's like what it's, it's all about. To me it's that that my, you know, my brother's big into golf and he always talks about the golf shot. You could have 80 shots in an individual 18 holes or whatever, but you hit that one off the off the tee on the par five and it makes that perfect sound and it lands in the fairway and that's the one that makes you come back again next week. Mm-hmm. And I feel like cycling is is that and the roads you guys are talking about yeah. and, and those experiences are are the they just make you feel like little kids again and and it's it's harder to do that in urban environments, whereas where you guys are is you have just endless endless yarns of roads like that that are just like we having having ridden them and having experienced some of those roads where we turned off and it's like we're all looking at our gps like did it say left here this is where the dots go but this doesn't seem like a road we're on a jeep trail this is fun let's go play in the mud and then you forget what you're doing and you're like oh we got to turn right up ahead like oh that was like just having those experiences and being taken out of your moment instead of just like sitting on a road and putting out watts and like just pedaling along that that has its place but Mm -hmm. there's something about the adventure that i think taps into something that's bigger so we were successful in our idea that we were going to train on these gravel roads all spring and and we were successful with uh with the lumberjack and and during this process pretty much every time we were out training, we had the same thoughts. And, and oftentimes they were at the same time. Um, I don't know whether it was because we were on a, a particular stretch that was either fun or scenic or, or what it was, but oftentimes we had the same thought that we, and, and we would voice our, our thoughts out loud that we, we need to get more people out here because this is amazing. And we saw nobody. We couldn't understand how we didn't see so many other people out here because the trails were closed or too muddy to have any fun on. And this was the next best thing. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, that's a classic problem. Like Southern Ohio. I mean, we didn't get open trails for more than one day till June. And it's the challenge of the weather and the, we are blessed with clay and clay and all of that. Right. And, who knows what you know is happening with the the global warming or god knows what's going to happen with our climate over the next however long if we'll even be able to ride longer or less or more who knows it could just be hot as all get out and we could have no rain for a while but but not having a consistency of that everyone is always like like i'm the president of our local imba chapter they're like we need all weather trail and i'm like i i can't just make that that's not a thing It, it can be made to some extent but there's so many ways to find miles if you just get a little bit outside the urban core and find these farm roads and these gravel roads. Like, it's a... Those are all-weather trails. Yeah. yeah. They're untapped resources. Open every day. You know, being mountain bikers... Because somebody's got to drive their car down them. Yeah, exactly. Um, mountain bikers, we, we just you suffer so much in the spring because you want to get out and ride so bad, right? And then when we found these roads, like... This is an outlet for us to get out and get some serious miles and go really fast, hit some roads that are challenging. It's all, I mean, they're, they're 18 foot wide mountain bike trails, you know, cause right. there's rocks and there's, you got to pick your lines and it's not like you're out there just bored to death. It's really a challenge. I feel like gravel roads have, have made spring mountain bike Facebook fights almost a thing of the past because it invariably <laughs> That's when you see the arguments show up on Facebook or Twitter or things like that. It's people that are cooped up and they want to go ride their mountain bike. And it's like, yeah, go, go ride, go ride trail. Go, it just happens to be coated in six inches of rock or, mm-hmm. or pea gravel or whatever it is. It's like, and, and you're right is there's so many things during the, the Ronda where we were, we were going down and bombing descents at 48, 50 miles an hour and, you hit a berm and you roost rock and you're like, Oh, I crashed. I just didn't go down. And if you take 
if you take your eye off the ball for a second, like it makes you it makes you pay attention. But it's mm-hmm. it's cool because of that. You can't just shut your brain off and tune out. Right. So you're having these conversations about wanting to bring more people out. You're saying, wow, this is amazing. We need to find a way to share this. Like, w- were there any things that were giving you ideas about what that could look like? Was there anything that was like, you know, this thing's similar to this thing. We could figure this out. Well, what did that process look like? Yeah. Well, you know, resource online, we could easily Google other uh, gravel events and we didn't really know a lot about gravel cycling we just started finding the dirty cans and these other events like okay these are gr- these are really cool and this is what they're doing we applied what we knew about the lumberjack what we really liked about it there's some ap- applications there we were able to apply uh, we knew we had a fantastic route uh, but you know for us it, once we decided we were going to go and make this not just a group ride but uh, an event where we're going to charge a fee and get a sponsors and rent venues and all that stuff we said we're going to do it right we're going to go and do the best job we can with the venues and websites and and just try to make it a top-notch event and and this is a this is an important point to pause i think because i'm sure every one of our listeners has been on a ride where they want to share that ride with everybody and they, and then they have the conversation with their riding partner it's like oh we should put on a we should put it on an event and have it here and really show off our area and then there's an ellipses, and it doesn't go anywhere. So what, for both of you, what do you think got you over that hump of having an idea, but then kind of having the balls to go after it and go get it? Well, because not everybody has it. Yeah. Right, not everybody has it. It's, it's actually very, very rare. If you look at all the events that are out there um, and you compare them, uh, to each other, there the you know the the cream's gonna rise to the top. It always does, and I think what's what's helped us be successful that that same accountability that we held each other to when we were training, we still hold each other to that. Um, there are there's very rarely a um, conversation that we have about the Black Fork that there's not an argument between us. Um, as to ha- what direction we want to go in, and and n- neither one of us makes a decision unless we both make that decision. So there's a lot of arguing and and back and forth and and discovery before we find out what that is. But I I truly think that it's it's the accountability. We were we made a commitment to each other and to our wives that we were going to hold a first class event and do the best we can possibly do. Um, and, and that's what we've held each other accountable to. So what did the timeline for this look like? Like from, from idea and, and we're Blistering talking fast 20, 2014 training for lumberjack to first event was 2016, right? Yes. In 2016 was the first, uh, event we, uh, talked about this for, we talked about getting folks out on the gravel road for about a year. And when we finally decided it was going to be this type of event that did this, um, it was a short period of time. Um, I, think, I think around first of the year, January one, and then we had a April, a late April <laughs> event date. Get to work, boys! <clears throat> yeah, wow. we you know, and we did a lot of planning. We knew what we <laughs> knew our fast. route. We had explored. We knew a loop we wanted to do. We initial our first year was one thirty mile loop, and right. we we. Had, Really nailed that down, and so we knew what the route was. But once we said, "Let's go," let's put it on bike ridge, and you know, here's what our fees will be, and we got to get a website up and running, and so people know what they're going to get, what right. they're spending their money well, for. Well, and, that, and that's part of this too. Is is I kind of want to like use you guys as as almost a a roadmap, yeah, for blueprint, like, yeah. Like, what was what did what did that look like for you guys in terms of? Okay, so it's January one. We know the route. And then how did how did each one of your responsibilities kind of unfold and and be able to bring this thing to life? Well, we, we just, uh, you know, we create a, a to-do list. And, Jay, you're good at this. I'm good at that. Uh, we, our wa- we got our wives involved. My wife's accounting. Um, she's She ran her own, off, her own business, and so she's good at that. Uh, she's why Sobey's uh, good in insurance and other aspects. So we really tried to divvy it up all between the, f- the four of us. Um, 
but it was really just uh, having that list of things and then go for it. You know, just um, I've never built a website before, but you know, get a go- free Google and and just <laughs> make it yeah. work and put yeah. as much information on Yay it as possible. Yay, Squarespace! Yeah, yeah. friends I mean, of the show yeah. who are not yet sponsoring us. Yeah, what's up, Squarespace? Yeah. What's up, Squarespace? Send some loot. Yeah, so and, and just uh, you know, we research what other folks are doing. We knew when we Jay and I when we do an event cycling event uh, when we go to one we would like a ton of information we want to know where it's at when would to be there just as much as we can give us we research it when so we wanted that to be what we're about as well when you're doing a long distance e- event unless you're a monster on a bike you need to know everything about that event you're going to do the research you guys probably did the research the, for the so Ronde. so yeah. Let's no. You, you guys are speaking my language. My counterpart here is the guy who just jumps off the building and figures out how he's going to land later. Yeah, Squirrel he, suit. He just goes with you because so, he knows that I'm going to keep him safe right. and not let him die. Mostly. Yeah, but what I'm <laughs> like, I'm just like, I don't know. I'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, but I think that's important, and 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 you guys appreciate that like if that's built into the dna of a race there is a comfortability that people have making it be an entry for them or making it be a opening for them to reach out to something new i mean i think you look at a lot of these super long mountain bike races and they scare the bejesus out of me right but i'm doing a seven day stage race next year and I'm not even I'm not scared about it. I'm excited because I'm like 30 miles a day. I can do 30 miles a day. I'll be beaten by the end of it. But someone picks up my bags and moves all my stuff while I'm riding like those sort of things. Those sort of logistical pieces of stuff really put people at ease. It does. And and we want to make that uh, we want to make our event very clear what it is, what you should expect um, and know what you're you know, you're paying for every every bit of it. So from a from a construction perspective, it sounds like you guys had your route as kind of letter A. It was it was A for sure. That was the key. That was the first thing we had to get down. Um, and I tell you, Matt wouldn't have it any other way. The route has to be perfect. And and I completely agree from because from a from an event perspective, that's your product. Everything else is not to call it window dressing because all of that stuff is important. Making sure you have. If you have lodging, if you have aid stations, if you have packet pickup, all of those things sure. need to flow. But if you can have the most well-run event, if your course is garbage, your event is going to struggle because it's just it's not something that people want to make want to make a bucket list. So if you have your route, like what's what's the next thing that you guys? Because I you know I really want to build people a roadmap, and I want to I want to kind of break down some of those barriers for some of our listeners that that have these great routes, whether it's in North Dakota or California or wherever, and show them that they can, even if they just build a local group ride, that's that's making an impact in, into the world. And so what did what was the next step for you guys in building Black Fork Gravel Grinder? Well, I- if the route is A, then B has to be the, the fun factor after the ride. Um, Sounds like you're talking about beer. Yeah. And you, the, the, ven- the venue, <laughs> yeah, the re- the venue really no. where you, where you start where you drink at. beer, yeah, yeah no, no, sure, no, right, right, yeah. No, venue is important. Everything Venue's surrounding yeah. the beer, sure, yeah. right, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and we did our research on on that as well, um, and we continue to do research. We we're not done by any means growing or making our product a, a better product. Um, every year we want to improve something, and we have a list of things we want to do to improve. Um, and that that research, uh, that's well, that's why we go all over the country to find the the best or what we feel are the best um, races, and we go we go do those races because we want to see what they have. That's why. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. why. Yeah. Market sure. research. Market. Sure. Yeah. Market. Market. market re- yeah. We're doing air quotes right now. So um, I know this is gonna suck, honey, but I'm gonna be gone for uh, the majority of the spring and summer we're doing market research right. it's science sorry about that. <laughs> i'm doing science si- sorry about the kids <laughs> and all that stuff. all right good uh, this is a good plan i back this yeah well so you know. we're, we're gonna edit this out because our <laughs> wives are gonna be listening to this we're just gassing them up no no but but it, there is something to be said for that right if you want to learn how to build an airplane you don't go like look at the guy who keeps crashing them you go and you look at 
Airbus, and you're like, Airbus, you build an airplane. What can we do like you that's real good and do better? Or what can we take learnings-wise from this company and grow ourselves? I think that's a, a responsible way to do that. So now you're looking at building out the the, the accoutrements and, and the venue and that kind of that atmosphere that surrounds the race. What do you feel the most critical piece of that really is when you're building that atmosphere? What's your kind of guiding light? That's a good question. Um, guiding light. I think... Uh I think you want it to be really all inclusive. You know, you you want folks that are out there to you know your, your hardcore racers to feel comfortable and know that they're going to be chip timed and and uh, they're going to be able to compete with other racers and 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 have that element. But you also you want somebody who's new to gravel cycling to be able to come out and know they're they're not going to be judged. They're they're just they're out there to have a you know a, a great time as well and just. And, uh, enjoy themselves and do something different and see the scenery. So trying to create that environment, uh, that openness, um, which, you know, it's, it's, it can be a challenge, but I think gravel is really good at that because it's, uh, yeah, you know, ours, our particular event has multiple distances and they're diff- you know, different challenge levels. So I think it, uh, it kind of caters to that. Well, that was that was going to be my follow up. Is we we've, we've talked about that a lot on on our show specifically. We talked about it with Ryan when when he was announcing the the Ronda initially. Is is gravel is kind of the closest thing that we have to an entry point for new people in cycling. Um, and I think about this when my wife's the one who got me into running, uh, and she started taking me to five Ks, and I. W- I would make fun of the people who would go to a 5K and do, you know, a two-mile warm-up and then be stretching and bouncing up and down on the starting line, and then they'd be gone. But they were competing to win that 5K. And now I'm that person when I go to cross races, warming up and making sure that I get my openers in and all of that stuff because I want to go perform well at a cross race. So what... And and you you're kind of starting to outline some of that stuff, Matt, with with having different distances and and things like that. But what are what are some of the other uh, less tangible items that you think you guys are doing well? And this question is for both of you: that the things you guys are doing well to help um, kind of embolden that behavior and make people feel comfortable. Because let's be real, and and we have had so many conversations with roadies and mountain bikers and cyclocross racers on this show and and almost everybody unanimously agrees that cycling can be an exclusionary sport whether it's the barrier for entry or the kind of mindset with different types of racers and different egos and things like that but somehow you guys have shown the midwest a little bit of a blueprint and I'm curious as to what some of you don't have to share all the secret sauce, but like what some of that secret sauce is. Well, one thing it, and a lot of people will, will think this is a small aspect to what we do. And, and it really doesn't take a lot of, uh, um, thought behind it. And it, and it, it doesn't take a lot of energy either, but one thing we do that, um, I believe is a big deal to our, our racers and our riders you won't cross our finish line without us acknowledging you by handing you an ice cold beer that that's coming directly from us. And that's, that's a big deal. I think for our, our racers and riders, we, and it doesn't matter what distance you're riding or racing in makes no difference. We're going to treat you the same coming across that finish line. You're going to get big high fives. You're going to get hugs and you're going to get that cold beer. There's a level of, personal involvement that I think speaks volumes about why this event matters to you. That I mean, it sounds like a small investment, but it's important. Like well, it's a, it's you you say that it's a small investment, but for the person whether it's the f- it's the winner of the race or it's the last person that crosses the line for the shortest route that had just did their first ever bike event that moment is the world whether it's celebrating a win or celebrating you just did this amazing thing that you, yeah, that you, have, you had no experience with you have no idea what their story was getting there you have no idea yeah. all the things you're dealing with but you're honoring that person in the exact same way that the person who 
beat everybody did. And that, I think, is an important lesson that we all need to take just in other places of our life. But that is a that is a as a really key thing. I think that's a great, great way to operate. Well, to yeah. to. To further that, we, you know, I think that that attitude that we have towards our finishers, towards our racers and riders, um, it, it's that attitude is is throughout the entire finish line, uh, the venue. We have our finish line right at the venue, so we want all of our our competitors all and all of our riders to to finish, and then be right there, able to cheer on everybody else coming in, and and that's important. It was important for us when we were racing, and and it's super important for us to make sure that people are having a good time. They they just got done suffering, uh, whether they're doing the twenty three thirty or fifty four miles, they're suffering all the same, and we want them to get appreciated crossing that finish line like everybody else. Yeah, we love whooping it up for the people that are coming in at five hours, you know, compared to the winners that are three and a half or whatever. It's they're, so much more fun, really, because. You know, these people have been out suffering. They're on comfort bikes. Right. They're yeah. way well, out of and, shape. And I mean, you got to give these people credit because they've just done a long <laughs> ride. They've gone to war. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you're three and a half hour people. They've been cheered for before. And and thinking about that specifically is, is you know, I'm thinking back to like finishing Barry Roubaix this year is you come into you come into the downtown area and it's lined like it's a USA crit and and there's music playing there's people lining the streets and and i mean they start the 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 riot fencing like 12 blocks back so you're in this tunnel and you just hear all this noise and and i you know you make the 90 degree and you see the finish line i look down i was doing like 32 and it's you can't help but just like like a fly to to honey type thing of like this is I'm just going towards the energy and you're just getting really excited and you forget about trying to finish under four hours or whatever I was trying to do. And you're just so living in the moment. And and it was even and events like that are even cool because like right when I was rolling through the pros that won the 62 mile, which was what I was doing, were like looping back on their cool down. And I got to ride the last couple miles with the the pro teams and and they were doing the same thing is like oh you guys are doing awesome you're killing it that's all you're almost done it's all you gotta but, do is go uh, up here but you know why that is it's because those three and a half hour people remember what it was like to be a five hour person right and when you see those five hour people and you're a three and a half hour person who's had three beers right <laughs> you're like no what i did I train for to do, th- but that person and the amount of effort they've put in deserves to be recognized. And you're building that culture of that. Yeah, that's, that's what important. it's about. It's, yeah. it's about the culture. Yeah, you know, and and that's the what gravel should be because gravel was set up to have this culture. So that that's an interesting point. Is 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 this something only gravel can do? Matt's making a face at me. I, I was <laughs> no, I don't <laughs> think so. I think I think all. Different types of cycling. They really want to be inclusive and bring new people. I, I think what gravel is really good at is since, you know, you're out on roads that have very few cars and it's wide open. It can be very social. It can be very competitive. It's just, it makes it maybe a little easier to do than some of the other, you know, bike genres. You know, it's, you're, we're not doing it in waves. You know, everybody sure. goes off together. You know, uh, well, the way ours is set up is that our 54 milers will, will catch a lot of the 30s because it's like a longer loop, but then they come back. and yeah. So you could be this 30-miler suffering up this hill, and next thing you know, you're getting passed by a train of guys that are going who knows how fast. And that's that's fun. We actually saw that at the Lumberjack when we did it. We were finishing our – just about to finish our second lap at about 66 miles. And we were doing okay at that time. We weren't suffering too bad. And all of a sudden, these two guys go by us at like 20-something miles an hour. Well, they were th- finishing. They had five miles to go in the race – and they were like, and just hammered by us. We're like, what the hell was that? <laughs> like, hey, those are the winners. They're about to finish. And that energized us. And we thought that was a really cool aspect of the Lumberjack to get passed by pros, literally professionals, when we were out on the same you know, racetrack as they were. So that's why we set up our, our route. So people get to kind of experience that. Ben Peacock, who, guy from Scotland, who was a national time trial champion there, he said he passed a girl down the hill. He was doing like 50. She probably was like, 
and he waved and said hi to her, and she's probably like, what the hell was that? You know, and so she it gets to experience what yeah. real hardcore cycling is about. So I think that was is a fun factor that you know, gravel can add to. Like you saw, you know, you're just you explained a little bit about how much thoughtfulness we put into the routes and and what we want people to to see. That was just one aspect um, that we took from the lumberjack, and it was it was one thing we talked about at the end of the race, and it was one of the first things when we decided we were going to do multiple routes. It was one of the first things we said we wanted to have is we wanted to have it so. We could see the the hardcore 54 milers come in and pass some of the 23s and some of the 30s so they can experience the same thing that we thought was so cool. Yeah, you got to take those learnings from all your market research, right? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) right. Right. But there's a lot of things you can learn that aren't necessarily good, right? You're going to also learn the opposite. Where do you guys think that you've had some some challenges that have taught you things? Uh, we do we do look for where events struggle. We've seen you know, where folks will win the overall event, and they just kind of bike off to their car. And I'm sure they have a they had a great award ceremony, but they weren't recognized. So we we pick up on that. We didn't like how they did this. We didn't like how they did that. How can we not do that? So we're we we're very attuned to those as well. Yeah, but outside outside of that, like. Have there have there been over? So you started in 2016, right? We're, we're now going into year. So it's be the f- fifth year, right? So you've had four years to screw up. Yep, and we've gotten very lucky. But has there been anything you're like that was a near miss? Yes. This is something we need to change. This is something we're going to do. Where have those learnings been for you? What do you think the the biggest one you've pulled away? So um, when we did the first year of multiple routes our signage uh was not as good as it is now and i i think signage is is the bane of 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 a race director's existence uh and so we we learned from that that we had we need to have bigger brighter more bold signs to make sure that folks know exactly where to go now we we did a lot of research and and we thought we were good, but when whenever you have even one person miss a sign, then you failed to some extent. And, and that's how we take it. We take it very personally, and, and we take it to heart. So we've done a lot of work to make sure that people don't miss our 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 uh, signs. So with with signage comes, I'm sure, a lot of red tape, even though you're in the middle of you know, relative the country of, of Ohio. Um, so what does your, what does your kind of core signage look like? And, and so we, yeah, cause so our listener can, can kind of get a feeling for what it is. And then what is, what does the application look like for you guys? Because you can't just take and put like a 14 foot billboard in the middle of the road. You can <laughs> for a little <laughs> while, <laughs> But there's basically two theories, right? There's either you don't sign a thing and you give someone a GPS file and it's completely unsupported. And if you miss the turn, it's on you. We didn't sign anything. There's no signage whatsoever. Well, you, you did at the beginning, but you signed yeah. away right. insurance and all that. Correct. Yeah. yeah. But like we are not we are not giving you road markers. Here's your GPS file. Go. But then the other side of that is what you guys try to do, and I think there is some, there are some pitfalls. And I think you know when John's asking about that sign, there are some challenges there. How, what have you found that works? So we wanted to make sure our signs were not, um, that they didn't take away from the scenery. Sure. So we wanted our signages, uh, signage to be um, uh, rustic, but still able to be seen. So I handmade all the signs in my in my backyard. Hold up. What? Yep. Every <laughs> every there are eighty <laughs> some signs, ninety signs. Uh, we're up to now that now we we've gotten a little more. So we're up to uh, ninety eight signs that I've made in my backyard by hand. So they're, ma- they're made <laughs> of pallets, a pallet lumber, <laughs> old pallet lumber. Okay, um, that's good. That's good lumber. Yeah, it is. Uh, oh, it's great lumber. It's heavy as hell and it takes up a lot of space too. That's why I want to <laughs> like pause on this and and like challenge everyone listening to this to think about just any route that you've ever put together for your friends and now think about a sign for every single turn every single 
creek crossing or any any sort of warning and think about how many signs that's going to be now you guys have how many routes for 2020 we have three routes and they all intertwine so a lot of signs left right straights um so how 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 much time are you investing in making one sign um one sign will take me probably uh, an hour to make well, it's good you have a hundred already made. made. Yeah, so they're made, so so that where helps. and where no one take these signs. Yeah, yeah leave well. them where they are. Where do they live during so like <laughs> not not Black Fork season? Another funny story. So um, I had to build a apparatus that hangs from the roof of my garage to house these signs. Um, <laughs> and so when you open the door, my truck still fits, but when you open the door to the garage. All you can see is neon yellow, orange, and green. It's like a canoe sling I above, lo- I right? Love yeah, it is. I love <laughs> this. It's above. Yeah, the perfect. specific word choice of apparatus. You didn't build a lift. You didn't build a containment system. You built. It sounds like Rube Goldberg. Right yeah, now. no, yeah, without a doubt. So yeah, so that's that's what I bring to the Black Fourteen is <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. sign building and apparatus <laughs> yeah. construction. That's like on his business card, right? We spend more time doing signage than probably anything else because we'll go out the week before and we, we kind of pre-mark and stake the location so the morning of because we put these out. We drive, we leave the shelter where we start our venue campground at 4 in the morning. Right. You can't put them out at 9 o'clock because there's too many kids out goofing off. So we have to wait till they're asleep and passed out before we can put up our signs. So we we'll, uh, we have these we have them pre-marked the week before we'll st- we install them that night. Um, and we what, s- we what's split that? T- up. What's that team look like? How many people? We split up. So I take uh, two people in my car, two in his, um, and we kind of go opposite directions. We do the same section every year, so I know exactly where this particular sign goes. They're all numbered. Uh, it's it is a sign, so we can get it done. In it takes us about two and a half hours to install them. Um, that the morning of. So is the r- is the road marked as well? We d- we basically leave no trace. When we pull out Saturday night, you cannot see anything that was there. That w- there's no marking. There's nothing left up on a tree or a post. Everything is gone. So, our we've had you know local townships and folks. They don't like that. They really don't like pavement marking right. because it's just another thing. And they and the p- our part of the state where we're our event is at take a lot of pride in their homes or roads so we just would rather not well and it's a it's a very natural area and you don't want to have like you're saying like fluorescent yellow paint yeah on the ground or on the pavement for eternity yeah so signage was a thing you learned that needed to be addressed and obviously you guys found a, found a way to to do that better as you look forward and you start to build out, you know, the the future, where are the things that you're looking to to make changes and why do you think those things are important? Yeah, we we definitely want to um, improve just the atmosphere um, before and after um, we are during the event. And it's great, uh, but I think you can always improve just that vibe um, this uh, this year. We're going to try to amp up Friday night. Uh, we've, we're, our, our event is at a campground, so last year we had uh, 20 or so people camping. It's a huge site, so we, we'd love to have 100 people camping. So try to encourage them to come in. We'd, we'd like to have 400 people camping. Yeah, yeah, literally everybody. All right, Pebbles, so say, uh, uh, we yeah, will challenge. meet all of yeah. you. We'll meet all of you, Pebbles. Call yeah. it dropped. Uh, so we're talking um, beer, music, campfire, pre-check-in, just try to make it as much fun as possible Friday evening. Um, that's definitely an area we want to amp up as well. We also want to make sure that uh, our riders uh, have the safest atmosphere that they can. It is gravel, and th- there are steep hills, so and there's a lot of downhills that are that are very tricky, uh, very sketchy. Um, but we we want to um, make sure that we have enough emergency personnel at the venue or along the route uh, to make sure if something does happen that we can take care of them right away. We do a pretty good job, or we felt we've done a pretty good job in the past, and, and and knock on wood, we haven't had any issues that we couldn't take care of with the personnel we've had, but um, we think we could do better. We, we think we should do better. It's our responsibility, and we're growing every year, so the, um, the chances of something happening with, with more people that uh, 
uh, the more we want to make sure that that risk is mitigated. Yeah. Who's doing that real well right now that you've seen in your market research? <laughs> well, the, the Barry did a nice job. When we did that a couple years back, and I saw the ambulance on the road, side of the road a couple times. They also so have amazing signage. They do. Yes. Barry does it right, and that's why they have 3,000 cyclists yeah. come. I mean, they do it. Well, sure, but at some point with 3,000 cyclists, you almost are building in your own safety infrastructure, right? Because – no one's going to be very far from somebody. Right. That's true. Yeah. So more people should just come. That'll help as right. well, right? Yeah. You can do that exactly. as well. That <laughs> starts yeah. to increase so your numbers. Basically. So you said so you said the word sketchy descent, and and I want to be careful if we're if we're talking about creating events to bring new people into the sport. I don't want to use industry lingo. Can you use different words for somebody that is that's maybe done an ms150 or a charity ride of some sort and and is curious about getting into something that's a little bit more challenging and they're hearing about gravel but they hear the word sketchy descent and we're talking about you know medical transport and knocking on wood <laughs> and stuff like that right that could get in somebody's head so what l like let's actually pick that apart and let's like dive into that a little bit so define sketchy and like let's make it very very clear what we're talking about so there's not one um mile on our route that is not completely doable with just about any bike um that is manufactured out there right now uh, we had a guy um not this past year but the year before who took his three-year-old daughter in a trailer behind his mountain bike um rode the full 23 miles uh, obviously he only did the 23 miles because he had his daughter with him and she had a ball. She, uh, she came across the finish line and in the trailer with peanut butter and jelly spread all over her face <laughs> with a <his laughs> sandwich in one hand and just grinning ear to ear and thought it was great. Um, so I, I don't want to scare anybody off by it, but it is gravel and there's a, there's an, an aspect. If you, if you go too fast on gravel down a hill that you're not, uh, comfortable with there there's uh there's some danger involved um but there's there's nothing on this route that's not doable this is not a mountain bike trail right um yeah it's, with it's drops gravel. and roots and that right. sort of stuff right but it's loose gravel it's loose gravel so if you have a bike with brakes you will be okay so to that point what is what would you for that person what would you recommend they bring so, I mean, that's a loaded question because if you ask 10 people, you get 10 different answers about what well, you that, should Well, that's why I love events like this is he and I debated bike setup for the Ronda for months sure. leading up to it. Yep. Um, and, and Matt and I will argue back and forth. So I'm going to answer the question and Matt can answer it later if you'd like. And it's going to be a different answer. Good. I want um, this. Yeah, this is so good. I want to see. I wanna, this is good. This is good. Getting This is deep in the psyche. All right. Okay. So, so, so I've, had the, I've had the most fun on – our routes on my fat bike. I love gravel on a fat bike. Now I'm not going to win any races, <laughs> uh, but I don't know if I'd win a race if I wasn't on the fat bike. But um, yeah, I, but the fat I love bike it. fat bike gives you a nice excuse. Like, oh, right. I totally <laughs> smashed. Exactly. <laughs> Totally would have so, smashed you. Yeah. Oh, Matt's just exactly. like, yes, yeah, see, exactly. This is <laughs> Matt just nods right. like, yeah, see. But I, but I, but I, I enjoy a, a gravel rig with drop bars, and and I I like the wide drop bar, um, gravel specific bikes or or a cyclocross bike, something with disc brakes, obviously. Um, I like riding that type of bike on 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 this type of terrain. Now, Matt, on the other hand, Matt, yeah, I. Uh, Folks will ask me occasionally what kind of bike they should bring, and I always tell them a mountain bike because, one, it's going to climb better, right? It's just geared to climb steep hills, and we've got a lot of them. And you're going to have much more fun on the downhills. You know, you're going to be nice and wide with your handlebars. You're going to have some suspension. You're just going to have more fun. You're not going to go as fast, but I, that's me. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm more about the fun of it than the fast portion. I just yeah. want to have more fun over my five-hour ride. Well, and that that's that's kind of the sweet spot of we're talking about like why gravel and what does gravel do that other things can and and it's this conversation because it's kind of a run what you brung environment and you're both making very good points about I mean we listed cross bike, gravel bike, fat bike, mountain bike, 
Uh, I mean, the only thing we haven't mentioned is like fat tire, t- like 25, 28s on a road bike. But I don't, I'm sure you've had people. Yeah, we've had um, plenty. Yeah. We've had yeah. plenty of them. There, there's always That's that. not my there's, idea of fun. There's always that guy. Um, and that guy does it with pride, I think, as well. And on, generally on faster purpose. than I do, so that's fine. But it's it's one of those things where, like, Matt, you're exactly right. Is It's it's what you want to get out of it. And if if comfort and that anxiety is there, then a mountain bike is going to give you more. You're going to have 160, 180 mil rotor to slow you down a little bit more. You're going to have suspension and a fatter casing on your tire to help absorb some of those bumps. And fat bike, even more so, to just glide over a lot of that stuff and you're not going to roost around nearly as much. But if you want to go faster, like... I've I've honestly never had more fun, and this is one of those, like, don't tell the wife thing of, like ripping down gravel descents at you know f- i think my my top speed at the ronda was like 52.8 and and in that <laughs> in those moments you're 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 hyper focused on what you're doing ripping down a road descent is fun but there's something about going that fast and knowing that you're just kind of floating along that's like next level fun for me sure and is. i and i say that understanding full well what what the consequences of that are um, but I'm also very confident in in what I'm doing. And in the intro of this episode, there will be Amanda. Do not listen to this episode. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought you were going to say that you were going to cut Matt's that wife. out. Jay and Matt's yeah. wives are not allowed to listen. Right. to this. Now I just got to say something that'll scare Ellen, and we'll get everybody. But it, it but it's those it's it's those experiences I think that um, really define what what makes these events special. Is it's not about necessarily competition as much as it is trying to get the most out of it like they're very selfish events but in like the best communal way possible Mm -hmm. because you guys are building this great route that has great scenery through the area that you grew up in and you're wanting to show off your your region of the world and show off your event to the world um but everybody gets kind of control of their own destiny in terms of they can make the event what they want out of it and there's very few events in kind of the cycling world that allow that to happen where it's okay to have a road bike lining up next to, you know, a plus size hardtail mountain bike next to a fat bike. Cause that you think about any other type of event and that's insane. Don't forget the kid trailer. Right. Can't forget the yeah, peanut butter with and jelly. With lots of peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, Step I'll stack peanut butter and jellies in my bike anyway. <laughs> I don't exactly. need a kid trailer for that. But I- if, if that is the atmosphere and that is the opportunity, right? The opportunity is that this is a thing that you guys have built Um, over the past four years now going into your fifth that has so many possibilities and so much of a broad spectrum what do you guys set out like as the lighthouse on the hill where do you guys want this to be in say five years like we're rolling year five what does another five look like where do you guys want this to be that's another argument we have often that's Mm -hmm. good that you're having an argument i like that you guys have arguments john and i have arguments all the time he's trying not to he's trying not to we have arguments all the time. Constructive discussions. <laughs> uh, well, I think it's important to frame it correctly Correct. because argu- argument has a connotation. Right. And I think what what Doug and I have for our show is similar to what you guys have. Is it never it's not personal, it's not angry, it's no. not any of those things. It's Jay, you have your your belief and your idea on a situation and a specific solve. Matt, you have yours and you guys are very passionate about it and you debate and try and come up with the best solution because two heads are better than one. And that's not like word choice. Very important when we're talking about, we are all about word choice this episode. Yeah. So John and I have arguments and so do you guys. <laughs> what are yours? <laughs> what are yours about? And what do you, what do you look for? Where are you, where are you, where's the lighthouse? Well, we, d- we did agree that we wanted to keep this under control. We wanted to make sure that the, the folks that did come out, we were able to make sure that they had a great time and they were safe and everything was good for them. And so to do that, you have to be under control. You have to, you, you can't o- open it uh, wide open. 3,000 registrations this year, right? And, 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 and then run out of food halfway through or, or beer, f- um, God forbid. Um, that's a riot. Yeah, that's a riot waiting to happen. Yeah. You know, right. So, so we did agree on that. It's just what we can control we didn't quite agree on or how fast we wanted to grow. Um, I would grow 
I mean, I, I would be okay with 2,000 people coming this year. But I know we couldn't be under control. Matt, on the other hand, wants to go more conservative. And, and I have to agree with it because we do want to keep that control. So it's a very this is like a very important pause point because th- this is something that I wanted to ask is is one I want to give both of you guys kudos for because there's a lot of a lot of people that go out into promoting events and they do it on their own and they can burn white hot for four five six ten years but eventually they're gonna get burned out because it's them and they've put all this on their shoulders and they may not have have built as broad of a network as you guys have built in terms of volunteers and helpers and just people to share the burden. Um, but another one that I've seen in just the, the like seven, eight years of, of being around events like this is things do grow too fast and it does get out of hand and, and people lose, lose the ability to kind of control all of it. And it grows beyond what their, their safety net is. So I'm curious what what you guys have put in place um, to kind of alleviate some of that of of burning each other out and and how do you how do you make that sustainable because it's this is not an easy undertaking. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of work. Um, our wives really help us keep keep us in check. Uh, one of our mission elements or you know goals is to make sure we have fun as a as an ownership between our wives and Jay and I. So um, if we get too big where where it's too stressful, too many people, we can't handle the food, we don't have enough volunteers, we start to lose the fun factor of it. So then we we need to make sure we scale it down and fix those areas of of the event that's just, that wasn't fun. We didn't enjoy that part. So how do we fix it? How do we make that better? So we would love to be the Barry Roubaix or the Iceman in Ohio where it's just a huge thing. Um, but we also have a, you know, there's a sweet spot where if you get so big, you, you kind of lose that and it becomes more of a business and it's not as much fun. So we're real careful about making sure that everything we do, we, we try to have a good time at it. Yeah. And so maybe, and maybe you step there eventually, but it's not just a running headlong. Right. Exactly. Incremental. You know, we, we have a goal of 400 people this year. Uh, we also, you know, the venue too, we, we work real closely with them and it's a huge campground, so it can grow a lot, but parking and, and showers and our shelter is only so big and you know, so we have to work with with them as well and in the roads we <laughs> we're we kind of gobble up the first few miles of roads or the, the cars can't really pass at that point we have highway patrol that monitor our first um, mile or so beyond that there's so many people coming down these hills that if you're a car trying to go up it you're pretty much just stopping and waiting for a half an hour 20 minutes whatever it takes for the bulk of cyclists to come down so we're real cautious in the neighborhood too and that we don't put people out because that can upset, you know, you get too many locals upset with you can really have a negative impact on an event too. And how do you manage all of that? Cause you guys, you've, you've both said it, you're both married. You both have other commitments, other jobs, other family, all these other things that are taking time away from something that you c- are both clearly incredibly passionate about. And, and Jay, you talking about all the specific details that you guys go through, and and Matt, you've said it as well. You guys are are so invested in this event and so deeply ingrained in it. How do you guys remain somewhat balanced the rest of the year, and then eventually, like we're getting into the season now, where I'm sure you guys are beginning to start to think about like, oh, it's about ramp up time. It's about like blackout season. Um, so how do you, how do you guys each of you remain balanced during all of that because it, it it we talk about it all the time with the show we invest a lot of time in this and when we're sitting with you guys this is a blast but there's pre-production post-production all of the other things that come with it that at a point when you're working 75 80 hours a week that it it can grind and it's hard to remain balanced in that situation and I'm I'm just like so curious how you guys are managing that. So it, it's not that difficult to manage it. Um, you said you, you, you made mention of a blackout period where, or a ramping up period. Well, there's no ramping up or blackout for us. We, we do this every day. Every single day we're doing something for the Black Fork. 
it's all year long. So it may be only a weekend or a day that that the event is actually taking place, but we immediately start processing the next year's event the day after. Do you have a huge fucking Gantt chart? Like like the world's biggest fucking Gantt chart? Because I would need that. I can't plan tomorrow, much less a year from now. We constantly plan. Um, our, we, we get together. Our families get together um, many, many times a year. And um, the first thing we do when if we're going to dinner or something together, because we do have fun together outside of, of Black Fork. But it's not really outside of Black Fork. Um, we'll get together, and the first thing we'll do is say, okay, let's talk business first. Let's start to plan. You know, what are we going to talk about this time? What are we going to do better next time? Or who's going to do this or that? And then, then we get on with our normal lives. So that, that's how we manage it. We, we spread it over. We don't have a peak season. We spread it over the whole, te- the yeah. whole year. We, so we s- also spend a lot of time when we're just biking together, that's our, that's our time to communicate about, okay, well, what do you think about doing this? What do you think about doing that? Because we're, we're getting some training in. We're, and Jay and I heading up to the Iceman. So when we do the rides, we, this is our time either when we're driving up to an event or when we're actually biking, we're bouncing ideas off each other. You know, hey, I just had something in my head. What do you think? And, yeah, I like that. Or yeah. Can we tweak it? What do you think about this? So is, is I mean, I, I assume the answer to this is yes, but is, th- is that – spreading it out over the course of the year, how you guys think that this is tenable for the next 25, 30 years? Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, and Matt's shaking his head, yes, right beside me, so that's a good thing. Um, because <laughs> yeah, no. if it was the other way, we'd... <laughs> we All right, be. podcast's over. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. But, uh, yeah, I think, you know, we're having a ball with this, and, um, it, and it's not getting harder. It's actually getting easier every year. We're getting better at what we do. Yeah, we, that's, that's we have a to-do list. We don't have a Gantt chart, but a long to-do list, and we just start checking off things. What do we need to do six months out, you know, three months out, the week of, the day of, after, you know. And we just now that we have that, you know, we add a little bit each year, but we're able to manage it. Yeah, it's growth. It's it's process, right? It's like anything else in your world. You 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 set a goal of a thing you want to do, and you start to figure out how to chunk it out. And and once you've done one. Like, all right, well, we can take notes and we got to fix these pieces, yeah. but we did Massage. this by this time. And now we have these new connections or these new pieces and these new things we need to do. And you can start to kind of backdate some of that a little bit. But I think that is smart, right? If you want to, if you want to eat the elephant, you do it one bite at a time. And if you, if you try to all too often people who, you know, I'm guilty of dealing with this too, where events sneak up. And you have to, like, scramble in the last two weeks to do stuff. And I'm sure you guys have to. But what you want to do is keep that stuff to a minimum and knock the easy, low-hanging fruit out. I mean, John and I are doing an event that is the first time we've been involved in this event. There are a lot of moving pieces and a lot of moving people and parts. And we're trying to figure out how to do it. Now, we're on a compressed timeline this year. But guess what? We want to do this event next year. And we're going to start planning as soon as we're done this one, because it's pretty straightforward. It's not a heavy lift, but it's like, what do we want to have in place, and how do you do that right? And I think that's a smart way to bite this off. You know, you can't you can't be like, I want to do this event tomorrow. You need promotion. You need to do all that right. stuff. So give yourself some lead time if you if you're thinking of doing this in your own pebble world, and and start planning that sort of stuff. Well, there's also there's also a very unique combination of things happening is is the gravel lot is you and i right black fork is jay and matt and their families and their families and but amanda and ellen like support us tremendously right in this and, piece and of it. for so like to that point for both of you does does black fork exist without the other person I don't think so. Like if it, if at no. some point one of you was just like I I can't do it, would would it continue? That would scare the hell out of me. <laughs> well, the f- the fun portion of it would almost go away. It would be work trying to manage this with by yourself or with somebody you didn't have the same relationship and and just intimate knowledge of the event. It just would not be see uh, fun. It'd be work. I think. But at that like, point. but to kind of where we were talking at the beginning is like giving somebody the the keys to the castle it were as to how to put an event together is this is a key component to it is there's no way that gravelot would exist without just doug or just john like it wouldn't happen 
and same thing with what you guys are doing and that's that to me is a key learning that that i want everybody to take away from this is you have to have you have to have somebody helping you out and it it like you could you could go like down the whole metaphor of like having a partner in life no matter what that partner is whether it's a best friend or your your spouse or whatever it is life is just easier when you have somebody helping you and you guys complement each other really well and and i think the the listeners can tell you guys have very different personalities and you have very different pragmatism uh, solutions um to to each of the individual problems and you bring unique perspectives to it and the the event wouldn't exist without both of you contributing something to it it's like i I just wanted to i assume that was going to be the answer that you guys were going to say no it doesn't exist but i mean you never know but just watching you guys interact and how you talk about it and your the things you get excited about in your own ways and watching your body language while we're talking about it it's like it's 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 a learning that i think people don't give enough credit to when they jump in and be like i want to get involved in promoting a race and i'm going to do it by myself and i'm going to me i'm going to take all the credit and it's like yeah maybe once and then you're going to hate it and you're not going to want to do it anymore but why not build something with your best friend i don't know just a thought it's just an an extension to our writing mm. i mean we've we've been writing together for 40 years or plus and it's just an extension of that we're just doing bike things together. Just playing bikes, man. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. And it's an excuse to play more bikes. Right. Right? You're like, we'll build a thing that will let us play bikes. You have your day job. You got to pay the bills. You got all that piece of it. But you get to do this thing and give back to the community. I think people miss sometimes that opportunity as opposed to, well, I would, I really like bikes, so I should go work for SRAM. It's like, is that really what you want to do? Or do you want to have a passion project that you can work on with your friend that's sustainable and takes care of itself and makes its money and does its thing? But do you want to build something that really changes the community? And what you're doing is you're giving people an opportunity to, A, see amazing places that you guys grew up that mean something to you, that routes that you guys have built over all these years, something that's you're passionate about. You're giving them an outlet to exercise, but you're doing it because you care about it. It's not... It's not like you're <laughs> it's not like the Black Fork gravel grinders got buying you guys Maseratis and Lamborghinis, right? Right? No, correct. No. no, it's not. I just want to double check <laughs> there because no. there was a moment I know, there where was I was a, like, like there was a pregnant there was pause. A, yeah, there. I was like, right? Because <laughs> if not, we John, we are in the wrong freaking business. <laughs> you, you, uh, no, you I hate to know what we were making over the course of the right. Year. No one yeah. wants to know. Yeah. <laughs> this is not this is this is not a cash cow, but this is something that's a passion project, and I think that's. I think when you approach something like that with someone that is your friend and you and you build a team around you of people who are like minded in that way, you can accomplish pretty amazing stuff. And you guys have done this. So rolling into year five, Black Fork Gravel Grinder, when is when is the date for this? When does it kick off this year? Yeah, May second. Is Reg open? Uh, it will open January one. You can go on Reg and, and look at the event, but at registration is January first. All right. So yeah, you you actually beat me to it. I was going to give you guys a chance before we ask our final question to to download See? download everybody on the twenty twenty details. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to have a huge party. At least we hope it's huge. <laughs> um, on Friday night, uh, we'll have beer there. Uh, we'll have a keg. We have music going. We'll have fire pits going. Um, packet pickup. Friday night, which is the first uh, Saturday, 10 a.m. sharp, the uh, the event will kick off, and the beer will start flowing right around uh, right noon. Noon for the real noon. early arrivals or the people who are showing up to cheer you on well, when you get back, right? Correct. I'm thinking uh, Matt and I will start the beer a little early. <laughs> you guys have a lot of high fives to start well, giving out. That's a lot. Of, at that point, you're like, well, good. Everybody, come on back. Yep. And they're up at f before four, so they're it's like That's five o'clock yeah. yeah. ish mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah, yeah exactly. Good yeah. way to think of it. Yeah, we don't we don't get any sleep the night before. That's for sure. We're we'll be up uh, late the night before prepping, and and we'll be up early. Like putting them signs in. Mm -hmm. yeah, putting yeah. them signs in. And what are the route options? So we have a twenty three mile, a thirty mile, and then our race option is fifty four miles. And what are the do you know the rough elevation for each one of them? About 110 feet per mile. For all three of them? For all three, yeah. Okay. That's good. Yep. Yeah, so it's pretty easy math. 23, 30, and 54, the first uh, four-ish miles will be together. And the first uh, two hills are the, the toughest two hills of the of the route. So Openers. We make, 
we make everybody do those two those two climbs. Yep. You earn um, your beer at the finish for yep. sure. No matter wh- what route length you're uh, you're going on, you will earn that beer. Um, registration opens like Matt said on the on the first. Um, it's on Bike Reg. Mm-hmm. Sweet, that's easy enough. We will certainly link to that in the show notes. Yeah. So Pebbles, you can find that there. Now you know what you're doing the first weekend of May. And uh, I'm planning on going because I have it in my calendar this year. And I have May, June, July. I have a lot of miles to get in before I go do BCBR. Couple. And I need a bunch of climbing because every day is like 3,000 meters. So I got <laughs> to do that. First, you got to learn what, what 3,000 meters means. Yeah, I know. It's a lot. It's like 9,000 <laughs> feet. It's stupid. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. So I got to do a lot of that. So I think I'm going to take your advice and ride my mountain bike in all these gravel events in the spring because it's probably I just need to get used to lugging it up hills a lot. Mm-hmm. So, but that means I get to have a lot of fun on the downs, which I'm kind of excited. So maybe uh, uh I'm also planning about doing Barry this year, John. Oh, yes. So I'm going to do Barry. Um so there's a lot of it's going to be a lot of fun gravel time and I'm excited to to get to come do this with you guys and uh come up and and ride those same hills we rode for the Ronda this year. It was good. Yeah. We are excited to have you. So, so you're so talking about yeah. So talking about registration, I should make a note that um, we're we're gonna, we're capping it out at 400 this year. Oh, so get in. And you're going to need to get in early if you want to get in this race. We we plan to sell out, um, and it'll be fairly early. Um, if history is an indicator of of where we're going to be, we'll, we'll have people upset not getting in. So get your registrations in early. It's a good problem to have. Mm-hmm. Not a bad problem. Yeah. It helps us plan keeps everything under control for sure yeah and then you know slowly like we said right stepping it out slowly maybe it grows a little bit next year and so on and so forth that's awesome i think that'll be great and if you feel like the the pressures are 400 400 of your friends at the start line at 10 a.m that sounds awesome yeah sounds wonderful yeah big group ride (laughs) massive group ride some of you might get strung out and left on the back but don't worry we'll pull you home yeah we'll We'll be be there drinking beers in the gravel lot when it's over yeah do they have a gravel lot there Gravel parking lot? Yeah. Um, yeah, they do. Absolutely. All right, we'll bring it. We'll bring it. We'll bring our uh, banners, and we'll, that will be the official. There's gravel a gravel lot, lot everywhere. There is. That's the whole point of this. You can always find a gravel lot. Exactly. Bingo. So, speaking of gravel and the pebbles, um, you know what we like to ask our guests at the end. Um, uh, we like to ask them what they'd like the pebbles to take home about the conversation we had, whether it's tangential or completely unrelated or whatnot, uh, just to kind of tie things together and, and give them a fine. It's like Jerry Springer's final thought, right? You know, like he'd always be like, all right, so here's my final thought. And then he something talk. very controlled that had nothing to do <laughs> with the white trash fight that just <laughs> happened on TV. Correct. Well, no, it generally did. It was like, well, this people are fighting over their illegitimate child. And sometimes we just all need to be kinder to one another. <laughs> So, in in the immortal words of Cincinnati and Jerry Springer, what are your guys' uh, final thoughts for today? Mine would be just to get out and explore on your bike. Um, We think gravel is one of the best ways of doing it. You're way way from cars. You're great places to ride. So, just just go explore. Have fun. That's that's right. He hit uh, the nail on the head. Have fun. Bikes are about fun. It doesn't have to be serious. You, You can be if that's what you do to have fun that's that's great but bikes are about fun and don't take yourself too serious i like that yeah that, and that's that's how we try to live it it's hard to remember that sometimes though when you're in the middle of it it's hard to remember that but it's, it's hard you got but it's hard but i think you can remember it's fun by exploring yeah and and thank you for everything you guys are doing for the area thank for thanks for the work that you guys are putting in um the time that it's taken and and sharing the area that you grew up with um and really putting together a, p- a premier event regardless of how quickly it grows uh, <laughs> th- and that's that's going to be a great bellwether in the future yeah. if, if it goes to a thousand next year we know that jay won the argument over the winter you know it. <laughs> yeah. arm so other arm wrestling contest yeah, yeah right i'm still arguing don't worry uh, <laughs> Well, this has been awesome, guys. Thanks so much for making the trip down here. We really are glad we were able to do this. Much, much more fun to do this in person than do it over the airwaves and and uh, yeah. and whatnot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks for coming down. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. So, what a fun interview that was with Jay and Matt. That like, what a good. 
pair of dudes. Awesome to have them down in the s- in the studio. Well, I mean, it's it, you say this all the time, or I say this all the time, that it's so cool to be able to talk to really not only interesting people but genuinely great humans. And both yeah. of them are very very sweet individuals. But you can tell when they when they interact, when they talk with each other, when they kind of parry and joust off each other, that they legitimately care deeply about each other and they care deeply about what they're doing together. It, it's neat. You it's, know. it's meaningful to be able to... And I w- this is one of those where I wish that we had uh, full streaming video because it was it was cool to be able to watch them and watch their facial expressions talk about something that they've built. Yeah, and I think anybody who's building things, y- you have that connection to it. And it's very noticeable, especially when you have a connection between friends who have built something together and they're proud of it. Um, and they should be. And we're excited to get to go do this. Remember, registration for the Black Fork Gravel Grinder opens January 1st. Hit it up on Bike Reg. Don't be do late. Do not sleep on this because if you are late, this is not going to go into like day two or day three for registration. I think you're going to miss it immediately. Um, I think it's going to blow up on day one. We're certainly excited that we are getting to go. My calendar um, invite is made, so I don't miss it. Yeah, because I don't want to screw this up. It would be real bad if we get bumped out of this race and we can't go and we're saying we're going. So we plan on doing it. We hope to see you there. If you have any questions about it, shoot them to the us over the next couple of days or shoot them to Jay and Matt. They will get you answers to your questions. As always, again, uh, we have packed up the Road ID Studios. This is the last show coming to you from the Road ID Studios in its current iteration. Yes. Um, they are building a new building. We are building a new studio. We will be on the on the wings for a little on while. The lamb. Yeah, we'll be wandering around a parking lot. If you see some podcasters with bikes in a parking lot or maybe like in my forerunner or something, yeah. then come say hi or bring us a coffee or something. Maybe. But thank you uh to them. Click the show the link in our show notes and save up to fifty percent on your next road ID order. And of course a huge thank you to all of you, old, new, first time listeners, long time callers, whatever you may be Please head on over to WideAnglePodium.com if you have not and become a WAP member today. Make sure to select the Gravelot as the show you want to support. It helps us get this done. Yeah, make a one-time donation, become a recurring member, buy the coffee, uh, like do all do that any, stuff. Do any of those things. Just, uh, just like get involved and, and support this because every single penny goes towards helping us bring this show to your ears each and every week and. Honestly, it allows us to do some of the bigger and better things that you guys are going to be seeing in season three. That we're trying season to season three make. Uh, we're trying to make some make some moves. Yeah, we're making cool. moves, not faking moves. That's correct. Yes. We'll have there's a gift for that. We'll get that one up. Also, we're brought to you this week by our great friends at Works. The Works Hydroshot is the absolute best tool you could get for, for defending your, for your fort. For defending your fort, as we discussed last week, yes. or for cleaning your bike. Which yeah. is actually what also you really good for that too. <laughs> Very good for cleaning your bike and defending your fort. Um, it is a portable power cleaner. It's got about 320 psi. Level 420. I just want to say 420. We're gonna stick with 420 <laughs> um, for the for the for the one that has two batteries on it, and it delivers at least five times the pressure of a regular hose. You can hook up to any water source. It has a whole bunch of angle settings. It doesn't blast your paint off, and you can clean your bike real effectively and quick, which you will need to do. After you've gone to the Black Fork Gravel Grinder. Yes. Or basically any spring riding. Well, even if you're on the road, your bike is yeah, going to get dis- It's going to be nasty. Disgusting. But, th- so, th- yeah, the one thing with that is, like, there's a there's a 20-volt version, which is 320 PSI. And I think that the 40-volt, which is basically two batteries, it uses yeah. the exact same battery. It's because 420 it works PSI. Is, works is smart. It's 420 PSI. It's four, okay, so now it's 420 PSI. Right. It's just hey, it works. Update your marketing. <laughs> Update your marketing. You so guys are missing a market here. Yeah, they, you're missing they, a whole market with so not calling they, it 400. They are missing a market, but they are offering this market 15 percent off all <laughs> Hydro Shots accessories. You I think there's actually a Venn diagram that overlaps quite a lot between probably. these two markets. Yeah, it's basically just a big circle. <laughs> it is. It's just a big circle. <laughs> Uh, you can get your works hydro shot at yourcleanbike.com. Enter code CLEANBIKE at checkout to get 15% off any and all hydro shot items, accessories, wands, whatever. Bags, forts. They need to sell forts. They do. I'm going to make this happen. <laughs> We're going to have a, like a works fort <laughs> built by an works. interchangeable like system of. It's got lights. Like you plug batteries into it and a bunch it of stuff. It yeah. Yes. It works good. You, if you, you it can't works get a, good. Oh, yeah. You can't go get a fort from them yet. <laughs> We're working on that. It's in the R&D uh-huh. phase. Uh, that, 
make sure you go to y o u r c l e a n b i k e dot com and enter the code c l e a n b i k e at checkout to get your fifteen percent off all the hydro shots and accessories. And we hope to see you out on the roads and trails this winter slash spring shoulder season, riding hard and riding clean. So before we close out today, we want to make sure that you guys got a little bit extra from today's episode as we try and do every week. So go support longtime supporter and last week's guest, yep. Dan and Grimpoor Brothers Coffee. He's provided two hand-roasted blends that are exclusively made for Pebbles, just like you, and all of the proceeds from the Full Schleck and the Hello Cyclocross Friends Espresso go to the networks on this specific wide-angle podium network of shows. Um, and I've I've heard rumblings, yeah, that there are that the the little gerbils within Grimpoor Brothers <laughs> are in the lab, uh, <laughs> developing some it's new blends. The gerbil I don't scientists. Know what, I don't know what gerbil scientists have to do with coffee, but hey, it's a thing. It's, it's how We're it works. We're protecting over there. forts with water pistols and power washers and gerbils inventing coffee blends. Hey, that's fine. Maybe those gerbils are wearing gloves while they're doing this, not they're to looking contaminate. Dope. And they are looking dope. Some of those gerbils like playing golf, and some of them like riding bikes. <laughs> Whether those gerbils are into riding bikes or playing golf, they can go to Hand Up Gloves and get amazing gloves and apparel from them. Uh, click the link in our show notes and use the code Pebble Dollar Sign at checkout to save you or your gerbils twenty percent off everything in their store. Awesome stuff, crazy good designs, and fun sayings on the on your little gerbil's hands. And developing a lot of new products. Yeah, just like just coming at regular. you. Like yeah. there's a lot of growth and and stuff coming yeah. out of that. And it's, it's cool. Awesome. It's cool to see small businesses like that kind of blowing up and, Heck yeah. and expanding their products. It is industry. exciting. So speaking of small businesses, also we're supported by Knox Gear. So stay safe riding or running after dark with their Tracer 360 vest, or keep your little furry butts safe with their Lighthound vest. Um, and all those are available in multiple sizes. So, like, yeah, whatever size your little your, fuzzy your butt animal. or your big fuzzy butt, um, or your your actual fuzzy pebble, butt. pebble fuzzy butt can be taken care of. Uh, both of them are crazy, crazy bright, bright using fiber optics and LED technology. We've posted some pictures on Instagram recently, and yeah. I think there's some videos of Murphy running around our house in the dark. And all I'll have to get some more with the color. kids. I'll have to get some more with the kids yeah. for us. Yeah, it's it's this is a great time of year to get them after like after dark when they go out and it's pitch black out and Murphy's all black to just watch like how bright the light is. It is kind of fun. Also, I as a bonus to you, you can save up to 35% off your order by using code PEBBLES at checkout. So head on over to Knox Gear and check that out. And don't forget to become a Widing a Pony member today. It'll get you exclusive access to bonus content that you as a member will only be able to get by becoming a member. It's like a nice little circle. That's how it works. Become a member, get stuff, get stuff by becoming a member. That's correct. Above all else, thank you all for giving TGL a chance. Uh, listening to us blather on in these ads and in general and talk to our, our, our awesome guests. And thank you for engaging with us. That's super important. We can't do this without the community. Yeah, we love hearing from you guys. So, and, and we haven't thrown this challenge out for a little while, but like, send us your ideas. Send us who you want us to talk to. Send us some it's things that you three. want us to guess. Like, it's time to raise a bar, I feel like. We, and we definitely done, we raised the bar. We done raised it already. In season two, we've got some some interviews in the can that you guys are definitely going to do the people's eyebrow to and say, how in the hell did you guys get that person? But that's what we want to keep doing. We want to keep surprising you guys and keep talking about about the stuff that you care about and keep talking to the people that you care about. So um, keep sending us your feedback. Whether we love hearing from you guys, whether it's meeting up in an event or you know getting. All of the digital input, social medias. Yeah, at the Gravel Lot, pretty much everywhere. Yeah, easy to find. At the the Gravel Lot five one three at gmail dot com is the email, or you can go just go to the website thegravellot dot com. There you can find all of our recent podcasts, all of our updated video, basically everything about what we got going on, all the the latest deals on all of our swag, all that stuff. So, but I think above all else, just hearing from you guys, hearing from the Pebbles makes our days just a little bit brighter because like it's it's so cool to like we just it we dug, thrive we thrive on that stuff we thrive on interacting with you it makes yeah. us feel good we the like to talk to you we like to hear how you're doing we like to know what's going on yeah in your this life. right now is doug and i sitting in a room just us 
and we're talking into microphones. But so I feel when like we I'm, get but, feedback, it's right. really handy. But I feel like we're talking to them. Yes. Because we are. We're talking to you. Right. You, you not them. You. Okay, we're talking to you. Yes. Yeah, that's that's hard to do. So I'd like to tell you about our intro and outro music, which is made by our good friends Have and band. Have you heard the good news? Have you heard the good news? <laughs> the, of Undertipper. Undertipper can be found at undertipper.bandcamp.com. Head on over there, buy some of their music, thank them for supporting this show. That is an a wrap for today. As we say each and every week, decisions and trails are made by those who show up. So if we don't see you on the trails this week, we'll see you next time. Bye, John. Bye, Doug. <laughs>